So a couple of episodes ago, we started talking about the dawning of urban modernity in Vienna with the Ringstrasse. And 30 years later, a whole new era of Viennese planning was inaugurated by uh, something called the Second Development Plan in 1893, for which, you know, there was a competition, the winner of which was Otto Wagner. In the 1890s, he was involved very heavily in a whole series of different urban and infrastructural initiatives, which I think we can kind of understand under the umbrella of like metropolitan projects, because what they, what they involve is a consideration of um, Vienna on a whole different scale, where the, where the ring, uh, you know, the ring is a sort of 500 meter strip it feels very big when you're on it. Like it feels like it dwarfs you as a human being, but essentially it's a kind of circum. Is it 500 meters? Isn't it much less than that? The road itself isn't 500 meters. Sorry, no. That I mean that would be yeah, that would be something. The whole zone. The whole yeah. zone is 500 and, and meters. And I feel that it's in some places it's narrower than that as so. well. Which is running around. If you imagine the plan of the city, like the urban core is sort of a blob just under a mile across, like less than that. Yeah, reason. so square miles about the size of the city. And then it's about the same again in the Ringstrasse. So if you think of the whole kind of area of Ringstrasse, that's like two and a half kilometres across, more or less. Whereas in Wagner's late proposal, modular plan for the expansible city, which is a sort of late version of his the kind of thinking which he's developing from the 1890s onwards, it's covering an area 40 by 30 kilometres, which is like London and the M25 kind of area. 20 times the size. And I wasn't quite sure, but like, how, what population do you think he's in, in anticipating like when that thing's built out to its full extent? Because it seems to be like a pop, like a, like a 10 million person city or something. Yeah, I mean, it's becoming like a mega city. Yeah. Like, like it's sort of sucked up like a third of the population of the entire state. And obviously that doesn't happen. That city's not built. That's the development of a, like a set of much more limited, but still quite meaningful projects, which are going on throughout the, the 1890s and, and after, which take in not only sort of urban planning and like the new zoning of new areas in the city, but also like a lot of what we would think of metropolitan urban infrastructure, stuff on the Danube to regulate its flow and new railway lines to serve the commuters in all of these new suburbs which are being built. Between those things, I th those are... Maybe not the most famous, but by far like the most visible. Of his, yeah, I mean, I think they're pretty famous legacies. in Vienna. Like, if you look on the like Vienna Otto Wagner City Guidebook, the front cover of it had got the lions from the dam, the sluice house, or whatever you want to call it, and that little bridge. Partly, think that's just like a sort of framing thing, and it's like, oh, big lions. That's a nice thing to to put on the front. But so I do think they have a kind of presence in the city. Uh, especially as like a lot of his a lot of his projects didn't really come off in a big way in the center in terms of kind of grand ceremonial buildings yeah. and there are some very important buildings which are like you know the church up on the hill or the big bank which we'll talk about but the bank is kind of very dressed down and the church is kind of not really central we should say this is about buildings and cities i'm luke jones i'm george kinjal and we're still talking about Otto Wagner and Viennese modernity. In this episode, we're going to talk a bit about Wagner's metropolitan plans and ideas. We're going to talk about his famous works on the Danube Canal at Nussdorf and Karlsbad, and the urban railways and stations that he designed. All, and I think he was appointed to those three jobs in 1890. 3, 1892 and 1894 respectively so there's like he has a good run at that point in his 50s yeah it's kind of funny it's like um we talked about robert moses and how he got all this power to build all this stuff otto wagner is never that powerful but he does seem to be put in charge of doing an awful lot i mean we said sure light rail and but he's also kind of in charge of like doing the design for how the city the development plan for the entire city. I mean, we're not necessarily going to talk about a lot of this, but it's worth mentioning like all this, like in banking the canals and rivers, mm. building viaducts and roads. A lot of the infrastructure of the city is kind of being planned by him. 
and he'll put his like pretty touches on like all of the arches supporting you know the high level road or embankment or something will have will have its particular his particular kind of imprint on it but there's a load of work of just kind of planning day-to-day city sort of civil engineering which the very most famous bits of these very various commissions are they're like one or two little bits of secession style but actually with them by far the most the, like the majority of it and i think the most interesting stuff is much more you know in his terms f- fit for purpose and it's in this distinctively sort of wagnerian fusion of 19th century engineering style and i think it's like classicism pro- prog historicism industrio industrio brock progressive <laughs> which is kind of he's he's that style yeah. uh and maybe some of the people who work for him like it's not really uh yeah he and like his descendants are that style there are other people like um and there's some super fun stuff i think it's very enjoyable Can we talk about the city a bit again we left it and you know we had the, the the cities become its own thing and they've taken down the city walls and things but it's growing fast by the 1890s do you have the like how the population grows over that time it's already by the time he's appointed it's already a big city I think it's like a million person city, but it's going to double and grow more over the next 20 years. Yeah, there were about half a million people in the city around the time of the ring. And then in the 1890s, it's like one and a half million. Yeah, so it's gone up by three times in 20 years and it's going to more than double again over the next 20 years. We know this phenomenon. It's like crash Chinese urbanism. I mean, like urban urbanization. It's the masses of people coming in to there's jobs in the city the economy is growing it's industrializing people are flooding in there's a lot of people with pretty low expectations from the countryside who've not been living terribly exciting lives and there's also like a load of people making money out of out of new businesses and this new bourgeois society it's easy to neglect a whole side of the city which is that there is a massive working like poor coming in it's kind of hard to get my head around because you go to Vienna now and you do not have like it does not have the vibe of a massively like working class city at all. Yeah, all the, the all, they've got all the famous cafes which have been there since like 1920 yeah. and like yeah. it's total sort of like stasis. Golden like it, it reached its golden age and then like yeah, its population it. still isn't as high as it was before the first world war. Obviously, the difference between it and a kind of rapidly urbanizing city now is that no cars basically people moving on foot and public transport like this is the the first great era of public transport public transport is what allows the city to exist but they are a bit behind the curve with that even still you know like it's why it has to be so small to start with but what enables this next phase is like light rail oh i think it's heavy rail and oh you think it's heavy rail it's a heavy urban heavy rail i would say yeah, that's because you have this thing where you think light rail is... What, what did you describe light rail of? It's just a bit crap, isn't it? People... And also, it's a thing which... <laughs> dear listen, dear listen, this is, this is something that Luke is very impassioned about. It it's a thing, sound very it's a thing which... Out. You know, there's that kind of people who, like, think that they're high information when they're actually low information. And, like, they, those kind of people are into light rail because it's sort of superficially, like, seems much cheaper than heavy rail. But the reason is that it has lots of things which it's not very good at. Okay, let's just say that Vienna's expansion is going to be powered by railways. Railways. Urban railways. <laughs> Urban railways. I think there probably is a, there's a mix, actually. I'm probably wrong about that. Uh, like, which is going to allow it to, to be a bigger size. The two big infrastructural interventions are the railways and the canal. And I think in some way the, there was a big drive to build the railways. There'd been an original proposal to build the Stadtbahn in the 1870s. The successful proposal for that had also involved Wagner, who would have been quite young at the time. And that was around the time of the World's Fair, which was held in Vienna in the 1870s. But there was an economic crisis. In... Um, it was called the Great Depression, uh, which is confusing. But it was, it was, and in fact, that was probably the period in which America overtook the United Kingdom and the Great Britain as being the world's oh, premier economic power. And it's this massive financial crisis yeah. which precipitates a big industrial slump yeah. um, in the, and, and a recession or like a kind of slowing of growth for yeah. like a decade and a half. Kind of, yeah, I mean, if you think about it's more like the 2008 financial crisis in its nature. Like it's this big yeah, yeah, banking financial thing, which like knocks down growth for like 
more than a decade. So basically, the whole that whole thing gets written off; it doesn't get started, and then they are getting going with it again in the 1890s, in part because of a sort of panic that Berlin has started building theirs, and they, there's a sort of competitive dynamic that they've got to catch up, um, and then the railway, the right to build the railway is made contingent on um, this work also being done to the Danube which I don't I don't not quite understand the um the politics of it maybe it's to you know protect people's property or something but there there's a whole series of works which are done to the Danube and to the canal to make it possible to control the water level yeah my hydrology is not very good I don't really understand what these what these things are doing but they're sort of raisable dams which allow the water to be held back is that it? What's going? What's going on with them? Well, it's strange because the way that Vienna works is that there is the Danube, but it doesn't really go through the city. I mean, sure, there's more Vienna on the other side of it, but it doesn't certainly go through the center of the city. But going through the center of the city is the Danube Canal, which is a big old thing, and that's kind of it's kind of always been there, and that's been the sort of port for for the city historically, and the big project. I think they were doing embankment works and clearing up the Danube itself and then also dredging out the canal and then putting the sluice, there are sluice gates, a series of them at either end, um, which allow rather like, you know, which allow a control of the water through the city. So that the water can either be held back or like, yeah, either prevented yeah, from going in like or... Reasonable... Yeah. There's a, there's a word for those sort of things, but I've forgotten what they're called, a dam. Like a big, raisable, lowerable dam. So should we talk... I mean, and each of them is a sort of little architectural ensemble. There are two big ones. One at Nussdorf and one at Kaiserbad. Uh, the one at Nussdorf has a sort of iron bridge going over with the uh, sluice suspended underneath it. And the one at Kaiserbad uses a crane. So there's no nothing actually over the canal at that point. And then both of them also have a building, uh, an administrative building. Uh, kind of service building for the sluice lock and they're quite different i think that they're built about 10 years apart and they have quite different styles i was going to talk about the nussdorf one first which is the uh, which is in this much more classical style i like the big part of the of the sort of ensemble is the bridge which reads from upstream as uh, like a really big beefy metal truss going across and at either end sort of anchored by a big plinth with a lion on it but then kind of visually is sort of seems to be propped up behind by this enormous big mass of stone which is a kind of articulated like a, like a sort of volute it's like a what would normally be like a quite small sculptural element in a in in a kind of classical language which has been inflated until it is you know as big as a as a house or something yeah it's a bit like these lines are sort of on like big go faster ships or something yeah, yeah, also or, or it doesn't look like it's doing anything at all there's there's the bridge which is actually quite a it looks superficially like really over specced like the uh, the amount of like iron and but steel that's going into that thing it's just like it's really a mass of like lots of lots of little tiny cross bracings and the profile is completely oblong it's like it's like this rectangle or full of metal work it feels so strong it's like yeah uh, and the lines are you could get the wrong idea they're 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 like on tall sort of pylons on tall like plinths which are the tallest bits of the structure you know probably like three four stories tall with with like big bronze lines on them um if you get into close to the bridge as well there's lots of like fine oak leaf bronzed ironwork or like you know lots of fiddly decorative ironwork as well uh it, like they it's definitely a language which is, it's kind of um, steampunk, like heavy industrial meets frilly details. Because it's kind of giganticist, isn't it? The way that mass is used, everything feels very kind of muscular and steroidal. Yeah, but then on each joint, there's going to be some like, not heraldic crest, but some sort of twiddly piece of bronze work. But the like, the, the, the like lion plinth and its thing behind it is literally like a kind of flexing arm. Yeah, and it is also made of huge pieces of granite. Which have a real sort of sense of I can remember just like if you go around like the docks in London you get a bit of this where you have these huge pieces of stone that they brought in and they're just um you know, in these photographs it doesn't look so big because you're not kind of quite up close to them but they're these huge big stones 
It's kind of extraordinary. I can't think of this being built at any other time. It, it feels like something out of a computer game. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love it. I, it, it establishes a couple of things which are which are common to the Wagner approach to this stuff. We, one of which is about like sort of color and material, which is the contrast between sort of something strong white stone or stucco, like something sort of white classical masonry-ish, feeling super monolithic and strong, and then green, either literally bronze or ironwork painted kind of bronze green or some kind of sea green. Yeah. as the sort of other element so at the level of kind of material and color that's one and then at the level of style there's it's also like classicism meets industrial engineer feeling but both of them both of them kind of as icons of themselves like the, the 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 there is a like a total this is such a heroic truss i mean obviously it is practical to design it sort of like this but it is also He's, I think he's super interested in what a truss looks like and how it can convey this kind of big cuboid strength. I was thinking it's got like, yeah, as you say, multiple languages which kind of go off in different directions and they're brought together in this quite exciting, like the granite work, the granite decorative work or the granite feels like German, like proto-expressionist monumental architecture, like the Leipzig Battle of the Nations Memorial, a huge like granite stone gray heroic monuments and then there's this light playful classicist box for the sort of associated building with uh, uh, cornices jetting out kind of white but with colored up details a bit of bit of like the color of, of you know those greek temple reconstructions where it's all sort of like white things with like lots of bright highlights and then the iron, the steelwork comes up so different in such great contrast to the stone. You've got this real sort of sharpness, which is also in the language of like the lions. The the, the strong metal fits in with the decorative metal, like like they're 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 trying to be blended together, one piece of this sort of three part. It's pretty cool. It's very cool. The other lock is the other sluice is really different. I think yeah, built later and it the classicism has been submerged much more in this kind of really stripped back box language. It's also kind of pretty. It's like a little... The it's most got, visible, a bit, got a bit of the Lido to it. It's got like this deeply suppressed memory of the sort of molding cornice around the top, but we put, turned into this like almost quite twee little sort of wave motif in this blue and white tile. But yeah, it feels like a little holiday village or something. It's quite except that except that it is clad in marble and granite. Yeah, but still, <laughs> like riveted, like it, it, we have now the first occurrence of one of his real uh, stylistic quirks, which is that he loves to have rectangular stone panels with the appearance of being held on with rivets. Uh, and here we've got them in um, granite on the sort of uh, tough ground rusticated ground plane and then uh like elegant marble panels above and the whole um facade and, and sort of treatment of that thing is studded e even though this is a much less grand affair and it sits very lightly on this massive retaining wall that's the retaining wall of the dam yeah. as a sort of box it's and it does feel a bit like a 30s bathing costume it does feel like it's reaching backwards and forwards at different styles, which is something that when you get someone really innovative uh, who's who's uh, changing the way, not just kind of taking accepted styles, you often get stuff that feels like it comes from different eras. Mm. It's like Chris Box, which feels sort of modern. It feels a bit deco. Yeah. And we're not even really in the like world of the nouveau yet. Uh, it feels industrial, but it also feels like a jeweled box. Like this thing of having these marble it all done on a grid of like ele elegant, tall, thin marble panels riveted to the facade yeah. uh, does make it feel like something that belongs much more in the kind of Habsburg treasure Viennese world, which isn't something that kind of has got an easy... I can't think of anywhere else where... Like there's also places that have like really um, ornate and beautiful like underground stations and like that's you know you think of moscow or paris or yeah. but not these sort of like crisp marble boxes no, the materiality is like it tends to be a language of like mosaics hard surfaces but not like crisp white 
marble. Uh, both of these also, yeah, the, the buildings that go with them have where, the, the placing of the pavilion boxes, which are like the sort of admin and yeah. engineering houses for these two sluice gates. They they feel like they're sitting as like little pavilions in a landscape park. Yeah. They're kind of they're set back a, a, a nice distance. They've got a bit of like landscaping around them. The first one's like right. If you can imagine, it's on a the sort of promontory where the canal, the thin bit of land between the canal and the river, where the canal is just starting to like break into the city, and that's kind of like gently landscape with this box with a with a like really protruding uh, cornice, or that's not a cornice. It's a anyway, you know, the bit around the top where the roof sticks out, sticks over. And this other one is sitting more in a landscape of like different levels of uh, retaining wall embankments and nice staircases. And they're very composed. And I think that composition is in modern architecture, it was talking about how the artistic touch has to be applied to everything. That's what's going to separate savagery from civilization, you know. First, the identification of need yeah. and like practicality, and then the artistic touch, like. But it, but without it, it's got, and that's what he's doing here. He's doing making these little. He's just like kicked it all into a lovely little yeah. sh composed corner, and they're 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 like that. They're very composed, kind of lovely things. Yeah, they are lovely. And the pavilions really make them, and I think the pavilions make them because the pavilions feel so unusual. Yeah. It's like you've got like the whole kind of idea of. The Viennese ideal city at that point. You've got like industry being surveyed by elegance, you know, like uh, like toughness and power, all this water stuff, industry and science, elegantly surveyed by these pavilions of you know, admin people. Quite classy. I mean, they don't look super cheap. I have to say, <laughs> no. Uh... Building was cheaper in the old days, though. All those people coming in off the fields. Riveting certainly was. Like, you don't need to rivet massive granite blocks in place. I mean, you barely need... You don't even need to mortar them in place. These things are massive. Like, those stones... I don't know how... I can't... I still want to judge exactly how big they are, but I have the impression that they weigh a ton. Granite's heavy. Yes. Also very frictional. So, I, I think the rivet's just about, like... It's a bit like industrial language... And it's a bit like like demonstrative tectonic. Yeah. And also blend like blending. Blending the worlds. The classical and the engineering infrastructural kind of have to lie down together. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely like the the like Lego protrudy bits on um you know what I mean, on the on the Greek temple, you've got the things which are like supposedly by Vitruvius meant to be like the pegs pegging the beams together. Ah uh, yes, yeah. Hold true to the origin. It feels it feels like that sort of thing's going on. And I suppose, although they're expensive, you can probably kind of hide that money in a big budget for doing the canal. I mean, the canal is a lot more expensive. Yeah, they probably spent, they'll, they'll have spent so much money on the embankment. I mean, because there's all granite, isn't it? Like, what, what is brick in London? It's funny because I think all the buildings are brick. Like, I think basically, maybe not absolutely, maybe some of the really grand ones have got some stone bits, but basically everything. And in fact, this goes for like, most old stone buildings like venice or they're all brick underneath it's it's little thin bits of stone stuck on with you don't need any more than that like any more than that is kind of gratuitous it's like a shame ruskin was really wrong um but the, it, it does look kind of look like they built this canal out of big blocks of this retaining wall at least at the front of it are pretty hefty blocks of granite i guess they could just float it up and down the river should we talk about the railway well, I guess, like, if people visit Vienna now, some of the most photographed things that he's really known for, he's known for two things, I think, which is the Majolica House and some of these tube stops. Yes. So he was the architectural advisor to the Stadtbahn. It doesn't really matter what the client was exactly. I think it was being built by kind of a private concession, but, but there, who'd been appointed. That's how a lot of these cities do it. You, you've got to get the money from somewhere often overseas or, you know, or if you've got a big industrial kind of capitalist class, you can raise it off them. 
and you give someone the monopoly and because the city's got to do all the like compulsory purchase cities never have enough money to actually do all the stuff they want to do so the idea is it's an urban railway there was a big there was a plan to do quite a lot more than they eventually did but it's it's kind of railways connecting the outer suburbs and sort of bringing them into you know into and through the center in this sort of classic european s-bahn model yeah, it's mostly high level, right? But it's, a mix, it's a mix of high and low level. And we'll, we'll get into the effect of that. So the two most famous stations, which are atypical, are the one at Karlsplatz, which is a sort of secession style one. And there's also a famous one, the Hof Pavilion, which is built for the use of the imperial family, which is this sort of special, <laughs> again, very feels very like, I don't know, weird sort of parallel universe steampunk kind of world. We're like... Um, I mean, I hate to say it, but like, like the the earliest railways in large parts of Germany and in fact Italy and places are the ones that connect the imperial palace to the centre of to like Parliament for the king <laughs> or duke or whatever it was they had there. There are basically two big standard models of station, one of which is the submerged one and one of which is the elevated one. Certainly, the most common surviving kind of his are the submerged form where the line has been built in a like an open cutting normally which is a sort of square pavilion at either end of the station quite kind of compact and boxy with a big opening in the front which is often spanned by one of these sort of classic like sort of decorative trusses it's a bit in that it feels like somewhere between a picture in metal of an industrial bridge or, or the kind of decorative ironwork around a Georgian balcony or kind of pergola. <laughs> yeah, that's it. They're like I icons of industrial... A icon in the sense of like a picture. Yeah, but it transposed down to this slightly like toy-like scale. So you'll have a sort of square truss, but where the middle of each sort of cross bracing has got um, a big decorative wreath in it. And then, yeah, as you say, there's this lovely one, I think now demolished, but which is a kind of round arch, a bit like one of these kind of huge trestle bridges, but shrunk down to a kind of toy town scale. And yeah, it, looks in like, these... it looks like the steel is like three mil thick as well. Quite kind of um, delightful. Anyway, between the two wings of this compact little pavilion, sometimes they'll also be propped up by these sort of like skeletal columns. One of the ways that he likes to try treat ironwork is to have these like a kind of square, what would be a kind of squarish, slightly Art Nouveau stone column, but rendered as a sort of metal skeleton of it. These tend to fit into general sort of civil engineering settings. Obviously, there's a line running along the river, which actually is what the Spitalau fired up Zaha projects on isn't it oh yeah that, that's on one of the elevated ones or it's over one of the there's a different type of the elevated ones which i'll go into in a sec they're clearly trying to create an identity it's kind of a normal thing now the rail company will have an identity for all its stations mm -hmm. like there's some weird quirks like a lot of the there was a period when all the the london underground stations built the edge of the roof when it's above ground would have these funny wooden like things that look like a sort of curtain fringe all along oh, the yes. edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, why were they doing those? But like, they're clearly like doing some particular stylistic... That was their thing, yeah. It's <laughs> a particular stylistic thing to create this identity. When it's all brought together, you've got like a typeface and that's going on here. There's a typeface, there's a logo, and there's a sort of building system, which is his stone render metal. The metal bits are not heroic though. They're, it's just that ornamental language which the, the sort of little cast decorative pieces that were we store in the in the sluice gates and things like that they look nice they're all in old grainy photographs because it does seem like they haven't done very well at surviving this type there are a bunch of them knocking around although all mostly slightly altered i mean just to say that like the other basic type the sort of utilitarian station type is for the elevated stations is a sort of long linear pavilion along the side of the elevated railway, where you have a sort of two-storey pavilion, which is the station and has stairs and things in it. And then the top is articulated a bit like a kind of glazed attic with towers, which look a bit like sort of Pliny's Villa kind of towers, you know, with ears and things. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking it's a variation on the classic high-level railway thing where you have to have a platform on either side and then a bridge that grows either under it or over it. Pretty grand. Yeah, it's quite grand. So this stuff is all, I think it's like 
white stucco or something like that. Uh, I don't think these are stone, but still it's got the kind of white and green. Yeah, it's all very neatly set out as well. There's a sort of, because they're building at them at the same time. This is a very un-London thing, so that there's, there's a kind of consistent sort of cornice line running from the elevated railway wall onto the station wall and all the way around. It's all like... Yeah. Well, this is the sort of stuff you can do when you're building everything all together. Um, and I think it's one of the problems with Otto's, like, idea of the kind of everything art, which is that you can kind of lay things out once, but something that the great city isn't just a perpetual expansion at a point. It also... It's not settled, It also no, kind of no. becomes a lived-in thing, which brings me on to the point that you've got to remember all this stuff is, like, it's really hard to think of those big blocky buildings in Vienna as being new, as just just coming out of dusty streets with just planted trees all around them and perhaps not enough people around looking a bit, a bit you know, strange, yeah. uh, uh, like a bit strange and new uh, in a way that like newly developed areas do look strange and new. They haven't kind of got all the businesses and inhabitations and signs of wear. He's designed them in a the way where they feel really bright and new in a way until they're covered in totally covered in dirt if you kind of paint it white it's still it's such a crisp white thing um with such crisp white lines and such crisp proportions it looks very like it can maintain that kind of looking like a poster from the right image yeah the ones which have not been egregiously fucked up work brilliantly as station still like they're and in a way they should because they're coping with the same amount of traffic there wasn't anything wrong about them yeah the ones that tend to like not work very well the ones where they were built for a certain number of people and then like the classic one is all the cities were shrinking for a while. So they were built like a certain, and then they like smashed it all to pieces and made it like small and rubbish and then just kept it small and rubbish when the number of people went right back up again. I really like them. I really like sort of riding on them. It gives the whole kind of experience of going on the, on the underground railway, a particular kind of weird old world sort of de quasi militaristic decorum, you know, these little white, they're quite Palladian, the style of the these stations. They're you know, yeah. quite kind of stripped back. It's a w white thing with a with a play of like tasteful proportions. Yeah, tasteful proportions and a kind of minimum of um, of uh, ornamentation or anything. Kind of flat pilasters and um, maybe a little occasional boss on the uh, uh, arch uh, entablature or whatever, but not much else. Then the, I mean the the two really fruity ones. The the Hof Pavilion is. I mean, both of them are sort of Jugendstil, uh, secession style kind of uh, vibe. The 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 Hof Pavilion is like this sort of centralized, kind of Rococo looking dome. I mean, how do you describe it? It's kind of got it with like incredibly intricate, I think, gold ironwork and big ellipse shaped like rose windows going into the into the top of it the structure of the station is fundamentally like one of those above ground stations yeah. but the core of it is small because it's just for the imperial family and flunkies it's got a very interesting lantern which is one of these sort of fruity it's a it's a sort of octagonal lantern coming up each side of the octagon has got a tall oval window in it and then there's a dome on top of that surrounded by or like you know with a kind of play of lines and strange decorative stuff that feels very of its time um which is a sort of play of baroque features baroque things but then taken out of scale rearranged and then with some stuff that's not really baroque like the dome itself feels a bit like a shrunk down pantheon or something from india um, and there's there's other sort of historicist things, and then these these big roundels with with um, they look like the ends of like ribbons or like sashes coming off them, which which crop up again and again. I think there's a thing where Austro-Hungary as an identity is allowed to sort of internalize these kind of like bits of Eastern Orientalist kitsch. Well, now they've got now they've got Bosnia. They're allowed to. It's sort of it's part of the identity. It's allowed to be in there somewhere. It's expressive of their yeah. Metternich their... said. East of Vienna is the Orient. They kind of situated themselves as not just the center of Europe, but possibly the center of the world. Everything north of them is the north. Everything west of them is the west. Everything east of them is the east. And everything south of them is the south. In a kind of global context. Uh, and that means that, they, yeah, yeah, they feel that they can 
internalize all sorts of things as being particularly them. The other interesting bit of this, well, actually, there's a few interesting other bits of this station in terms of if people are interested in like pieces of high quality opulence design. If you're, uh, if you've got a job recently for a for one of the classier it's dodgy quite, oligarchs or dictators, <laughs> it's got a hell of a carport, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got a hell of a carport. <laughs> Uh, presumably for like, yeah, the king's motor carriage, or uh, not even just just carriage carriage, which is which is made of all this like fine, decorative ironwork in kind of industrial baroque styling, lots of foliage. Foliage looks like it's got like a rolled steel roof, which is kind of like crinkly tin, yeah. crinkly tin yeah, roof. Yeah, 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 yeah. At the same time as being like a pergola, well, cool. It's got also a pretty impressive waiting room. It's still there and. Um, it's a bit like the inside of a Fabergé egg. Yeah. Like, it's got all these, this kind of motif of monstera leaves, which is in, like, enamel. Yeah. And then this kind of metallic, you really can't see it in this black and white photograph, but it's a gold and red, like, metallic ceiling yeah. that looks like it's made out of, like, hammered out sheets of brass or something. And then kind of, there's a painting, eagle eye view of um, Vienna on one of the walls with eagles painted on, just so you know that yeah, 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 yeah. you're you looking know at it from charge, above yeah, and yeah. also that you are like... Yeah, and then it's all all in Monstera theme. Like, we're in a language of tasteful yet imperial kitsch. This sort of decoration, this like very opulent but very flattened is is the sort of secession approach to decoration and bling generally, isn't it? Oh God, are those all double-headed eagles? I should hope so. I mean... Yeah. It, <laughs> Some things need to be reiterated, don't they? Yes, you're, you're quite right. It's surface decoration. Yeah. What picks this one out as being interesting is its material richness. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's surface decoration. It's like, like it's sort of non-literal depth, isn't it? Well, there's, I mean, there's a physical depth, actually. I mean, it's kind of hammered out to like a depth of like six mil. So it does have like it does have a slight changeability with light. And when you've got a like kind a of perceptual material, depth, which is much deeper than it's like than its literal depth. Yes, it's not it's much deeper than like William Morris wallpaper. He said it would be the depth of like one and a half inches. This is kind of like much, it's allowing itself to be much freer than that. Also big patterns here. I mean the Karlsplatz, sorry, yeah, Karlsplatz. It's got that big church with the two columns. And in fact, Otto Wagner had done a scheme to remodel a whole square with very big buildings, which yeah, didn't come uh, off. The Karlskirche by Fischer von Erlach. There's a fa there's a cartoon there's a contemporary cartoon of Fischer von Erlach consoling uh, Otto Wagner saying when I built my my building here they said I'd ruined the Karlsplatz. I don't know what else there is on the Karlsplatz that's I mean there's some perfectly respectable sort of buildings but nothing. We'll get into this a bit more in the next episode but there is a bit of a flavour of hubris and nemesis about this about this period in um in in Wagner's career because you know he is obviously becoming hugely successful and I think had like a major reputation, but he does also push things a bit far and I think fall a bit out of favour with the public at various times. Um, uh... Yeah, the public and also the... By the public, we mean like the oak, oak bourgeois and um, imperial circle of... And the, the, and the me like the media and newspapers, yeah. you know, all that kind of... So Karlsplatz is two pavilions facing each other across a road. And they're kind of similar. There's some great pictures in this book where they're really beaten up. <laughs> they obviously went through a bit of a tricky bit. I mean, one of them is a bar now, right? One's a bar and one's a, like a little pavilion Otto Wagner museum. Like, not a, not, a, not a terribly exciting bar when I was like... I didn't feel like staying there. They're also marble, no? God, I can't remember what they're actually made of. But they've got they've got all this floral flat... Again, flat floral decoration on the outside, don't they? It's like... It's a an oblong with a kind of... Horseshoe in elevation. Yeah, on the top. On yeah. the top, which com comes out with a skeleton of like fancy, fancy ironwork. Yeah, and that sort of frilly edged roof that makes it feel like a garden pavilion. Very nouveau. Yeah, very nouveau. Very decorative. very secession. Like pretty. Very pretty. Yeah. Very pretty. Very precious. They're quite little as well, yeah, which yeah. kind of makes them. Again, we're in that kind of jewelry box world. Very lavish. A lot of white gilt on the inside. I guess was something that was sort of standard. Like when I went down to for the uh, Austerlitz episode into the like W. H. Smith in Liverpool Street Station, it was all like like white walls and gilt everywhere. <laughs> yeah, here behind the fridges, <laughs> the fridge replete with like monster energy drinks is. I mean, one of the things he's into is shallow relief, isn't it? Like shallow relief um, detailing. There's a nice photo there of of one of these. What are they? There's is a sort of pilaster like motif on the barrel. 
uh, it's got the classic kind of nouveau thing where it feels very close to something drawn on the page it's got the you know it's like here here's um this sort of lovely sort of fluent drawn mm, sketch thing and it's almost been translated like directly yeah bass, into... bass relief but um very shallow uh and crisp like and it, it also feels historicist and non-specific as in is that egyptian is that roman well it's all kind of yeah it's neither yeah it's, it's blended it's blended um it's sort of oldy decorative -y. with a bit you know this sort of it's got a little bit of spice in there like it's got a little yeah. bit of like the it feels a little bit exotic is it yeah is it like is it metropolis is it sci-fi is the other one and i guess it's the language that was kind of picked up for that stuff later on those kind of curlicued floral like stamp decorations sit between like floral and art nouveau furniture and like tribal tattoo they're sort of it's not at some places it's literal leaves you know it's bay trees and monsteras and oak leaves and at some points it's like just a rippling surface distinctly different approach to what we think of as the product the architecture that goes with the industrial because that metalwork is definitely this is it's it's definitely an industrial thing it's using industrial materials but it feels like it's in the industrial world of the bibliothèque nationale yeah 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 or like or the, the paris metro like or the paris you, metro you know, where stations where instead of going the industrial world means a rational man we're in the industrial world gives us new possibilities new techniques new possibilities to stroll and be a dandy and like yeah before the narrative changes it's kind of that is a modernity right yeah absolutely and there's 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 loads of other lovely little details of like just like the designs of little little touches put on how you like hold up these um viaducts for the trains or arches in the viaducts at the low level or retaining walls which are often just like nice bits of I mean, one of the things which is consistent is that, you know, when there's a need for something sort of practically like, I don't know, these bits which sort of brace against one of the big girders on the on the on the rail bridge, you know, he'll sculpt them a bit like a, a kind of classical bracket or something like that. He's always making these things kind of decorous and yeah, often quite kind of pretty. I like it. Well, like yeah, they it all comes across kind of foppish. It's quite nice, yeah. but in a sort of charming way. But it's it. But at the same time, as being really tough. Because a massive granite pier. Yeah, I don't know where it is. Where is that? Where is that bridge which has like the enormous um, acorns on either side of it? That's one of the railway bridges, which has this enormously big, tough cross brace box girder, and then at one end it goes through this pair of of kind of plinth pylon things. With what are they? They're like big egg cups, big acorns. They're funny. So there's this 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 wreath with two like wreathy things coming down from it, which is everywhere, yeah. which I feel must mean something. He puts them on everything. They're on everything from the bank to <gasps> victory. Yeah, like like they're nothing as specific as an acorn. <laughs> it's sort of geometry. There's there's some which have, which have sort of come up like a giant toaster with rosettes on either side, and there's some that are that are like some kind of turned doorknob thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to describe these shapes because they're not... It's difficult to say it looks like that. You can have that in your minds. you just got to look it up. Look on the Instagram. It'll be up by then. Yeah, what is going on with all of this? What so... I mean... Yeah. What does it... So I think one of the motivations is to make the city as good and kind of commodious and in, like enjoyable as possible for its citizens. Um, and also definitely to civilize potentially like unartistic intrusion of these like industrial elements into it yeah to make them the products of art and to make them uh kind of sympathetic to the city and its sort of grandeur and its effect to make them proper lasting monuments it's definitely something where i don't know how conscious this is but there's definitely as we've said there's a thing where these like engineering architecture images are also sort of icons as much as anything from the classical language there are decorative girders there are decorative trusses there are in you say decorative but it's really important to maintain that it's the real truss 
Well, right. some of them, I think some of them, I mean, some of the one, some of the really little ones in those stations, I guess oh, they are. Oh, sure, yeah. sure, sure, sure. Sure, it's used as an iconography as well. But a lot of the trusses, the real trusses, are kind of decorated and most peculiarly decorated sometimes in their substance, like the literal cast beams of the thing will have a kind of ornamental character to them. The default thing to do nowadays is to kind of have a... a big piece of metal hiding behind something if you want to have it decorated it's kind of unusual now that we would actually make a, a piece of steel that's holding something up itself change its shape for purely decorative reasons yes it's hard to think how you would do that you can kind of change like the castellation of a beam you know where you cut out the the the, the the bit between the top and the bottom of the eye beam yeah they're like a kind of firandel fear and trusses that like are a sort of classic decorative um i mean not not just decorative but they they become like a form of ornament in it's oma's work for example you know it's, uh, <clears throat> among others i think you absolutely could do it but it's not something that we do i think for some people at the time a lot of what he was doing was seen kind of felt like quite transgressively and unpleasantly utilitarian that he was exposing too much of this steel that he was, uh, you know, that he wasn't dressing it up sufficiently. That's what, not how we would feel about it now. But I've got a side thought about that, but I would like to put, again, go back to the context, which is that, one, the city is being completely rebuilt. There's an old Vienna that we don't miss because it's gone. So part of the reaction, and that all the buildings that we think of as now the canonical sort of style of Vienna are new. It's new development. There are some great pictures which have a real kind of Chinese nail house feel to them, where you have like the little, the little kind of wooden houses, and then you have the Ringstrasse um, apartment buildings kind of looming over them. We're in a proper world of like all that is solid melts into air in capitalism world. Like people's worlds are being turned upside down. At the same time, you can do all this stuff because there's a lot of capital formation going on. This like rapid urban expansion, there's a lot of money being made and a lot of stuff has got to be built and property values are going up like crazy and you've got to put in a lot of infrastructure and there is, you know, in this place where you're not urbanizing that rapidly, it's really hard to get money together. But at this point when money is being made like crazy, there is money to be made spent on making nice tube stations. And you can kind of make the argument that in the context of building a tube line or a elevated suburban railway, it's affordable. And then there's the particular cultural position of Vienna. It is aspiring, as we've said before, to be the center of a sort of civilization. I don't think you need to put it in any more gentle way than that. The most idealistic way that it saw itself would be a little bit like the way that people talk about the European Union today. Like it is a kind of a union of all of these different peoples beneath the surface, people who are, have very different sorts of rights. But There's still uh, <laughs> serfs in this. Like at this point, there's still quite a lot of serfs. They got rid of them in, in, in the German, in, in the empire and the kingdom, but in the Slavic new bits of the empire, they, they are. And, and even in the German bits, there's a lot of people... You know, when people were released from serfdom, they were kind of mortgaged and they had to pay off like the mortgage of like, you, you're you free. Congratulations. You owe. The installments start now. You, yeah. The installments start now. You owe the money that was paid yeah. uh, to your previous owner. And you're going to owe that until after you're dead. But the, the, I think it's in, obviously these buildings are all being built, as it were, within the best possible version of this uh, yeah. of this because that's that's you know it's the center and the it's, kind of it's real um of it. real growth and imp improvement like i mean i'm sure you were much even if you were kind of hard hard up person like it's it's better to get be able to get in on the train line rather than have to walk for two hours or whatever which is what a lot of people did yeah and it must be very exciting but i can see where like service would come from it comes from it's an old strange imperial society but also everything is changing like crazy like, people are resistant to anything new. <laughs> it strikes me that these are so much more successful than something that feels similar, which is Tower Bridge in London. The famous Tower Bridge, that sort of mock gothic iron bridge, which is the same thing, which is it's, it's granite and steel bridge that opens. But its articulation feels really clunky. 
The gothic of it doesn't look very convincing. It looks pretty ropey and badly drawn. And then the steel structure just doesn't feel like it integrates well. And somehow it's become this absolute landmark. Whereas Otto Wagner is succeeding, I think, in managing to make these very different languages work together. Yes. He's a proper designer. He's a pro he can really draw. <laughs> he, he can really do it. Um, and he's sort of, you know, the, the suspicion in London at this time, contemporary to Otto Wagner and before, is that um, you don't want to let architects get involved in any of that. They'll only muck it up. You know, Qubit told, uh, who's the first like big mass builder, told Victoria you don't want to get architects involved in any of this re re redevelopment stuff. It's only going to, they're only going to like waste money and make it all awful. The, the only really, really important British building of the 19th century is designed by a gardener, uh, Crystal Palace. The Crystal Palace. But Otto Wagner is proving them wrong. You can kind of constantly integrate these different components together with a single language and like, okay, he's exposing the steelwork. Well, it's a flipping steel bridge. You can't clad the whole thing in stone. And if you did, it would look really stupid. <laughs> Yes, it's also, I mean, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because, um, like, in the 20s, after this rupture and the collapse, there are lots of writers who write about, who write in this kind of strange, ambivalent, nostalgic way about the empire that was. And, you know, people like Robert Musil or Joseph Roth, or, like, there's an enormous... They're very long books. I haven't read any of them. Not all of them are. I mean, like... Well, the, Musil's uh, is. <laughs> okay, Musil's is, yep. Um, <laughs> right. but, like, but... There is a sense, like, there's a sense that like this was an unbelievably contradictory and strange society. But what's interesting about Wagner's, um, about this is like it's able to make this very convincing sort of aesthetic unity around, you know, here's the railway, here's the city, here's the kind of imperial sort of symbolism everywhere, it sort of brings it all together. Um, uh, you would think looking at it, that this is a sort of project from a society which makes some kind of sense rather than being one which is incredibly like bizarre and destined to be torn apart by it. its like internal contradictions. It doesn't feel like it's so much there, but when you look at it in these things, it feels like it's from a comic book or a computer game. I was rereading some Mobius comics and it really feels like that, like sci-fi. He's got like, you know, the Inkle's like sci-fi, but with like a bit of like French 18th century in it. And it sort of feels like it's a bit in that world. This the kind of mixing of technology and like imperial pomposity. It's very strange. Um, he holds it together. He has a kind of urban, a theory for how the city should continue to expand. He has this kind of sketch of this very futuristic sketch of the city from 1911, which we mentioned at the beginning. And he also, he wrote a book, which I think has not been translated, but he, which luckily is, is sort of pressed in a, a little article that he wrote for Architectural Record called The Development of a Great City. Well, but I think it's a summation of his ideas. And although his, the, the, the particular plans in this didn't come off, it's not like it was completely not implemented. Yeah. It wasn't implemented to the letter, but this stuff was sort of done a bit. And the idea is, firstly, he's imagining, he takes a few axioms. One, all cities want to grow lots quickly. Uh, the, the, you know, and he's imagining, like the Vienna of his time, double every 20 years or more. Two or three times every 20 years you want to grow. You want to put on, you want to put on 100,000 new people every year. And the way in which to civilize that is to add to the city in the form of a kind of sort of quasi autonomous districts, like districts which make sense, uh, which he describes at one point as uh, a series of beautiful and at the same time practically convenient miniature cities. That's the that's the kind of vision. And each of these would be about two hundred thousand people. And also, he said, five hundred to a thousand hectares. A hundred hectares is a square kilometer. And in it, you would have a load of city blocks. He imagined everything as city blocks and he wants them to be kind of, you know, you ideally want them to be at least like eight stories tall or something. Yes. Yes. Topping out. He, so he has a, an exemplary uh, one of these that he illustrates where they, they top out at 23 meters or nothing is higher than 23 meters. Well, that's because that's the rule in Vienna. 23 plus plus an Attica story. 
Yeah. So, but they, yeah, they're they're kind of uniformly like big blocky things. He doesn't. He doesn't want. He has the. There's a sort of decorum about how these residential blocks should present themselves. They shouldn't be too showy. Yeah, they've got to fit into the city. It's funny given what we're going to talk about in the next episode, which is some of the showiest, some of the showiest blocks of flats you have seen in your life. People change, don't they? I mean, actually, these are... they don't. They don't. He's doing the same thing. He's doing these two things at the same time. He's just got one rule for himself. That's all. He says at one point that in the sort of planning of these like city blocks of this like city district, one of the the big artistic de- decision is the building line. So this is kind of the limit that you're setting up, and the the kind of he's really into the effect of really big long avenues with buildings with like big cuboidal buildings of relatively the same size. Yeah, like. this is a grid. It's the first thing we're talking about a grid. And occasionally, some of the blocks are parks, like arranged geometrically. And then there's like main road or main axis between two. Like there's a block, a kind of central line of blocks in the middle, which will have at the center of it a kind of public square with some public buildings. He describes all the different public things, you know, you've got to have a police station, a library, a court, a morgue. The garden is described, he calls it an air center um, yeah having park... like slang people off for um talking about how the parks are the lungs of the city which he is very down on in modern architecture he's but he's actually also believes in these charlatans <laughs> proposing this he's kind of well i don't know if he believes it or if he is just selling he's someone who kind of goes back and forth on intellectual honesty versus salesmanship he definitely can do both so yeah it's a grid city it's got it's dense but not super dense no the the roads are quite wide their roads are all over 20 meters wide but it looked like about 50 percent built up area it's all dense and it's all walk kind of walkable and the transport is by primarily by railway between the districts i got a sense of like rail and trams almost big broad roads so it's like tall but with less of the land covered in buildings than you would expect and a central population and that these are kind of like you can kind of make the city out of a mass of these you can just like keep plonking these things down kind of spiraling out from the center of the city you can have a few on the go at any one time Um, and his proposal is that the the way the city should control development is that they should buy all the land on the outskirts of the city. Mm-hmm. They shouldn't allow like low-grade crummy development, and then they should make all the money off the appreciation of the value from agricultural to urban land. And then that can make the money to build the beautiful buildings that are the things that he most likes doing, in, primarily probably in the city centre. But he has a kind of... a vision of what the good life would be in for the kind of the metropolitan man is a sort of description of walking around walking around this city yes he describes the uninterrupted vista of a main thoroughfare flanked by fine stores displaying the artistic products of the city and of the country to the view of the crowds hurrying by other streets through which one may stroll for an outing and regale himself to the extent of his pocketbook a sufficient number of good restaurants where one may find both satisfaction and relaxation open squares where public monuments and buildings in artistic settings present themselves to the gaze of the beholder and many other like factors not here enumerated such are the things that give to the city its characteristic physiognomy i mean bourgeois utopia isn't it it's what benjamin's nostalgic about in the arcades right you you're kind of like a guy swanning around well no but i think here the arcades it's because they're past it yeah, 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 but this is like before it. It's or, or during it. It's kind of like yeah. I think the arcades were a little bit earlier than this, but the, yeah. yeah. But it's the same idea that you're you're like a person. I got I got some money. I'm fitting into the city. I haven't got much status anxiety, uh, and I'm going to go past all these beautiful plate glass windows. Inside, there's going to be all these fancy decorative homeware items like lamps in the shape of whatever all kinds of yes fine vegetables produced by yeah and there's gonna you know beautiful as bunches of white asparagus cafes with mountains of whipped cream 
50 different kinds of brandy. And that's how I'm going to pass my hours of repose. I guess that's what people were aspiring to. That's what everyone, that's what, I mean, it feels a bit like in Vienna, that's still what, like, the kind of goal is, like, what the good life is. Or certainly, in a way. It's interesting because he hasn't got caught up in automobile hysteria, which will come in, like, about 10 years after this. I feel that the point when that lecture was given was the last point, when you, which is just before the First World War. After the First World War, automobile automobiles are just such an obvious thing. I'm on a page in the book that we're looking at, but it's a series of proposals for bridges that weren't built. And the background of the images is remarkably telling. I was thinking that the person that who is inhabiting this kind of imaginative passage in the in the essay is very much the person we see in his competition and drawings and proposals, more of which we'll discuss on the bonus, in fact, we're, we're going to do a little section on those. The image is it's in the centre of Vienna somewhere. I'd like to describe this image, which you should look at on the Instagram. It's a bridge, uh, and we're looking down it into the city on either side of the, the bank, are two grand Victorian walls of buildings, many stalls, stories tall, elegant, lots of arches and pediments, uh, and um, like elegant shops at the ground level. And then the bridge, which is very broad, at the points where presumably the supports are, there are there are columns on either side. At the top of those, there are busts of kind of Teutonic knights with huge shields and swords uh, guarding the entrance either way and there are beautiful iron lamps uh, on either side of where the, the pavement is there's trams and horses and ca carriages uh, but people throng the street and the road elegant men in bowler and top hats uh, couples you know the guy with a, a rugged and manly beard uh, uh, solid uh, woman with a beautiful bonnet or whatever. Uh, in the middle of the road stands a soldier with a spiked helmet or possibly a policeman. <laughs> Very reassuring. <laughs> Very reassuring and solid figure. And there is movement and people everywhere, but not too much. No congestion. Great density of buildings. And I really feel that sort of sophistication, kind of fruitiness... Density of people, but not too dense. Still clean, new uh, infrastructure, bright, bustling city is kind of what he's aiming for. Uh, and in fact, in the background of this image, there is a ghostly silhouette of a gothic spire, which I think probably the um, votive church, the um, which has kind of been vanished out, expunged. Uh, from this image of the new city. Yeah, well, he was hoping that they would get rid of it. I think <laughs> he regarded it as a great architectural mistake. Although he, at times he could be more sensitive about it. And I think you've got it all there, haven't you? There's some great drawings of other... He's, he did absolutely loads of really fruity... Most of the like fruity and expensive stuff didn't get built, as is generally the case with architecture, because it's very expensive. There's a great kind of an archive of competition and kind of speculative projects, which we're going to be discussing on one of the bonuses. So that may already have happened, or it may be about to be forthcoming if you are a, a subscriber to the Patreon. I feel like we should try and wrap this one up because we're... Yeah. It's, it's tricky because a lot of what we're talking about is kind of intangible which is that these are proposals. So there's the very tangible like sets of buildings around locks and things, but most of it's kind of like the idea of what the city is. Like a lot of what he's describing was kind of what it was already becoming. Like he didn't invent the block. He didn't invent the idea of putting it on a grid. These were sort of established ideas. He doesn't invent the idea that you have some grand buildings. Uh, the core idea and force that he puts on it is that it should be planned and it should be coherent um it should be planned from the point of view of practical necessity and like future pleasance but it also should be planned to have a kind of artistic vision of what the city is going to be in the center and in its suburbs and he's also a great believer in density yeah 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 definitely difficult to know what it would have been like if none of that had been done or like what difference if you'd taken him out it would have made 
like you wouldn't have had these beautiful buildings, the the, the train stations and um, sluice houses and that we've talked about, but there is effect on the, 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 the structure and formation of the city. It's kind of difficult to disentangle. I think so, yes. He definitely did make them more artistic, which he would have been proud of. Yeah. <laughs> and he's also terrifically pro-city and pro-growth. Yeah. I mean, it's what was going on at the time, and it must have been very exciting and a great time for an architect. Like, there's a lot of stuff being built. Yeah. It's very unlike the society that we live in. <laughs> The focus on like having everything coherent and like walkable and dense. You fly over like the North China Plain and you look down, and it doesn't seem like this. <laughs> yeah, although at least they got undergrounds. A lot of underground railways. Yeah, it's true. It's got true. A lot of underground railways. They're still they're big signed up to that in a big way. But they got a lot of other stuff going on. It just feels like it's not the sort of crash. Uh, but, and it, but it's so difficult to know what it was like. It's so difficult to know what it was like to be in this city. We've only got like the good bits and the propaganda left. The thing is, the other thing about it is that it, there's such an emphasis on on the kind of completeness of the urban sort of ensemble of the kind of public realm. You're not allowed to have like crap bits all over the place or a bunch of buildings floating around and they're not properly joined up. You know the way there were, like there were loads of those. I mean, he's reacting against it because there was loads of it. There's a real aspiration to finish everything off properly and kind of work yeah. through all of the, the the kind of uh, the landscaping of the of everything in granite and um you know. And I guess there's another thing which is sort of amazing, which is that when he died, or like just before then, you know, that the effect of the war, kind of. But like just before the war, the city had reached a, like a population that it hasn't yet achieved again. And in a way, because it sort of shrunk, the incentive to knock things down and build bigger buildings on them hasn't really been there. In the same, the pressure to, to, to kind of turn over the city hasn't existed in the same way. So, so much of this stuff, I don't know, it's a bit blown up in the war, the second war. But compared to anywhere else I can think of, it's a remarkably well preserved city at that scale. I mean, in fact, I think the population, it didn't quite halve, but it went down a lot. It got knocked about after the, in the first war, and then the empire was not there, and then there wasn't the sort of incentive, and then a lot of bad stuff happened uh, under the Third Reich. They got rid of the sort of 10% of people that were, or 8% of people that were Jewish, kind of. And then it's kind of a Cold War frontier, right? City of spies. And I guess it's sort of putting itself back together as a more normal place. Yeah, I mean, it is... In the it, European Union. <laughs> it's kind of... It will always have this weird thing of being an imperial capital in, like, a kind of fun-sized little country. Yeah. It's a, Which is, it gives it a weird... Yeah, a weird quality. I'm not the only one. I mean, they're all like that, actually, aren't they? Like, Budapest is also like that. I think we should wrap it up, because uh, we are trying to keep this short. So we... Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, so the... Um, at about underscore buildings is our social media handle if you're looking for images of the projects we've been talking about and if you want bonus material our patreon is at patreon.com slash about underscore buildings thanks very much for listening and uh good night night see you next time